Today we will be discussing the biomechanics of human bipedalism and gait. We will review our evolutionary biology and the story of how we came to walk. We'll discuss the concept of body kinematics and why it is important for walking. Finally, we will contextualize kinematics in the functional anatomy of the human body. Any discussion about how we move the way we move and why we do so is best prefaced with some background about our evolutionary biology. How our ancestors evolved out of hundreds of millions of years in response to the changing demands of their environments and behaviours to produce the adaptations that we live with today. The bottom line is that we have much to gain from considering the story of how and why the human body evolved if we wish to comprehend what humans are and are not adapted for. A background knowledge in anatomical terminologies and joint specific functional anatomy is assumed for the purposes of this recording. So the story of the human body can be broken down into five major transformations. The first of these transformations was bipedalism. We stood up and started walking on two feet. Charles Darwin first suggested this idea in 1871 reasoning that by becoming upright, our ancestors emancipated their hands from locomotion, freeing them for making and using tools, which then favoured the evolution of larger brains, language and other distinctive human features. A century and a half later, we now have enough evidence to suggest that Darwin wasn't far off the mark. We now know that the first homonyms were occasional bipeds who stood and walked upright in a distinctly non-human manner when they were not climbing trees. They could not stride as efficiently as modern humans, but they were probably able to walk upright with more efficiency and stability than a chimp or a gorilla. If we could observe them walking, we'd think that their gait was slightly odd as they stepped on side of their long, inwardly angled feet, taking short strides. It is tempting to imagine them wobbling about unstably on two legs like upright chimps, but this is unlikely. They were probably proficient at both walking and climbing, but they did so in a distinct fashion, unlike any creature alive today. So the first transition, upright bipedalism, then opened the door for the second major transformation. The second major transformation involved the descendants of these first ancestors, the Australopiths, who evolved adaptations to forage for and eat a wide range of foods other than mostly fruit. The figure graphs the temperature of the Earth's oceans over the last 10 million years. As you can see, between 10 and 5 million years ago, the entire Earth's climate cooled considerably. Although this cooling happened over millions of years and with endless fluctuations between warmer and colder periods, the overall effect in Africa was to cause rainforests to shrink and woodland habitats to expand. The implications for our distant ancestors was that, as the forest around them shrank and became woodland, the ripe fruits they hungered after became less abundant, more dispersed and more seasonal. These changes forced them to travel farther to get the same amount of food. These are a worthy introduction to the first key concept of gait biomechanics. That efficiency is crucial in evaluating gait biomechanics. Being able to travel farther, more efficiently for a lower energy cost would have selected for individuals who could more effectively source food. Let's consider our anatomy and specifically the shape of our hips. If you watch a chimpanzee walk upright, observe that it keeps its legs far apart and its upper body sways from side to side. Sober humans, in contrast, sway their torsos almost imperceptibly, which means that we can spend most of our energy moving forward instead of stabilizing the upper body. Our steadier gait is largely attributable to a simple change in the shape of our pelvis. As the figure shows, the large broad bone that forms the upper part of the pelvis, the ilium, is tall and faces backward in apes. But this part of the hip is short and faces sideways in humans. This sideways orientation is a crucial adaptation for bipedalism because it allows the muscles on the side of the hips, the small gluteals, to stabilize the upper body over each leg during walking when only one leg is on the ground. Chimps cannot stand or walk this way because their hips face backward permitting the same muscles only to extend the leg behind them and not control abduction. The sole way a chimp can avoid falling sideways when one leg is on the ground is by markedly tilting its trunk to the side above that leg 
which is inefficient for bipedal locomotion. Another important adaptation for being a biped is an S-shaped spine. Like other quadrupeds, apes have spines that curve gently. The front side is slightly concave. So when they stand upright, their trunks naturally tilt forward. In contrast, the human spine has two pairs of curves, bringing our center of mass back over our bipedal stance. The consequence of these adaptations is a more efficient gait. Laboratory studies that have enticed chimps to walk on treadmills while wearing oxygen masks have found that these apes spend four times more energy to walk on either two or four limbs a given distance than humans. That is a massive amount for a species trying to fulfill daily energy demands. Chimps walk comparatively little, only about two or three kilometers a day, or about one to two miles. Being able to walk farther using the same amount of energy would have been a very beneficial adaptation as the rainforests shrank, fragmented and opened up, causing preferred foods to become rarer and more dispersed. These adaptations contributed to the third major transition. About two million years ago, the earliest members of the human genus evolved to become the first hunter-gatherers. Bipedalism and our more diverse diets facilitated our ability to travel faster for longer, and by extension, our ability to hunt prey and gather resources over large distances. Running gait was central to this. Most humans voluntarily switch to running at approximately 2.3 to 2.5 meters per second, which corresponds closely to the intersection of the cost of transport curves for walking and running in humans. Basically, and in line with what I mentioned earlier about considering gait through a lens of efficiency, we start running when it becomes more efficient to do so than walking. At these higher speeds, running becomes less costly than walking by exploiting a mass spring mechanism that exchanges kinetic and potential energy very differently. From an evolutionary perspective, human endurance running speeds are exceptional compared to non-human primates. No primates other than humans are capable of endurance running. Well-conditioned human runners exceed the predicted preferred galloping speed for a 65 kilogram quadruped and can occasionally outrun horses over the extremely long distances that constrain these animals to optimal galloping speeds, typically a canter. This is not to say that humans can outdistance specialized quadrupeds. Some horse and dog breeds, for example, can be made to run more than 100 kilometers a day while carrying or pulling a human. Such extreme and human-induced feats, however, should not detract from the fact that humans can and do run long distances well. These first three adaptations, namely bipedalism, dietary diversification, and then hunting and gathering, predicated our spread across much of the old world, and our propensity for developing bigger brains and larger, more slowly growing bodies. These transitions allowed for modern Homo sapiens special capacities for language, culture, and cooperation. Essentially, they unlocked everything we consider characteristic of modern civilization. Now that we have covered a history of our bipedalism and locomotion, let us now delve into the specifics of walking and running gait. Walking and running gaits are cyclical movements. That is, they are recurrent movements with distinct, but related and repeating events. A single gait cycle is defined as the period from one initial contact of one foot to the following initial contact of the same foot. In walking gait, there are two subphases which partially overlap stance and swing. I say they overlap because the stance phase for one limb will begin before the contralateral limb has completed its swing phase. During the walking gait cycle, approximately 60% of time is spent in stance and 40% in swing. Under average walking speeds, each double limb support comprises 10% of the gait cycle, totaling 20%, whereas single limb stance accounts for the remaining 80% of the entire gait cycle. During slower walking speeds, the double limb support phase increases, whereas faster walking speeds reflect shorter double limb support periods. Stance is defined as the period from initial contact of the foot to toe off and is made up of the loading response, mid stance and terminal stance subphases. Swing is defined as the period from toe off of the foot to initial contact and is made up of initial swing, mid swing and terminal swing subphases. 
Your step length is the distance from initial contact of one foot to the next initial contact event of the contralateral foot. Whereas your stride length is the distance from initial contact of one foot to the next initial contact event of the same foot. Gait velocity is the stride length divided by stride time. And cadence is the number of steps per unit of time. All of these things, cadence, stride length, step length, step time, stride time, stance, swing, etc. are temporal spatial gait parameters. They allow us to formally define or characterize gait. These characteristics can be monitored with pressure mats, force platforms and 3D motion analysis camera systems. The study of kinematics involves the use of 3D motion analysis systems that digitally reconstruct the individual's body as a multi-segment system. Kinematics is not concerned with the forces, either internal or external, that cause the movement, but rather with the details of the movement itself. Construction of the coordinates and orientation of the rigid body segments allow calculation of joint angles of the proximal and distal segment, joint angular velocity and joint acceleration. These are all kinematic parameters. Essentially, this means we can evaluate the specific joint motions involved in the phases and subphases of the gait cycle with a view to gaining an understanding about how the body achieves the efficiencies of motion alluded to earlier. It is through studies of human gait with kinematic analyses that we know that during walking our legs function like pendulums that alternate their centre of rotation. When the leg is swinging forward, the centre of rotation is the hip, but when the leg is on the ground and supporting the body above, it becomes an upside down pendulum whose centre of rotation is the ankle. The kinetic energy and potential energy are out of phase. This reversal allows us to save energy. During the first half of every step, the leg's muscles contract to vault the body over the foot and ankle. This vaulting action raises the body's centre of mass, storing up potential energy. Then, during the second half of each step, this stored energy is mostly returned in the form of kinetic energy as the body's centre of mass falls. The net result of all this kinetic energy to potential energy exchange is that the body's centre of mass follows the trajectory of a smooth sinusoidal wave with low amplitude. This is really efficient, about as efficient as we could hope for with the biological architecture available to us. When it comes to running, the leg assumes a different role, functioning like a spring, stretching and recoiling. The spring stretches as the centre of mass falls in the first half of stance and recoils to help the body push up in the second half of stance and then into a jump. Unlike in walking, the body's kinetic energy and its potential energy are in phase. This reversal, again, allows us to save energy for what is essentially a different movement task, locomotion at faster speeds. We had discussed in previous lectures the adaptations provided by collagen-rich tendons and ligaments in the leg, such as the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia. We had said that the Achilles in particular is much larger in humans compared with apes and chimps. Long tendon structures like the Achilles allow us to store elastic strain energy during the initial breaking part of the support phase and then release the energy through recoil during the subsequent propulsive phase. In this lecture, we discussed the biomechanics of human bipedalism and gait. We started with the story of how we came to walk and run. Then we briefly outlined the sub-discipline of biomechanics relating to joint kinematics. We concluded by reviewing our functional anatomy and its relevance to human gait. This lecture was prepared for students in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science.